Hi, I'm Joe Lindsay. Welcome to How's the Form, a podcast for men in, let's say, the second half of life, like myself, over 50. How's the Form is brought to you by AGNI and is part of the Good Vibrations Over 50s Men's Health Programme, which is funded by Movember. My guest this week is best known as the face of BBC Northern Ireland Sports Broadcasting. He has been our man on the ground at some of the biggest sporting events of our time. He regularly rubs shoulders with sporting grace and may once have taken a private jet with Rory McElroy. As a kidney transplant patient, he's a vocal advocate for organ donation. He also has an extreme obsession with a rather surprising 80s musician. Stephen Watson, how's the form? Absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Really good form. It's great because I, I, we're going to get into a, a particular topic later on, <laughs> right? That's both very close to our hearts. Good. I.e. Morrissey. But let's hold off on that, yes. first of all. Uh, I wanted to ask, you uh, You recently graduated from, from Queen's in politics. I did. So how did you kind of make, what, what happened that made you go into the, the path of sport then? I, I went to university and studied history and politics. Right. Wasn't particularly good at the history part, so then focused on the politics. And I suppose at a time I was wanting to use that to get into journalism, news journalism. And I actually got accepted uh, into a postgraduate trainee job with the Belfast Telegraph. But suddenly an opportunity arose. I'd been on work experience in UTV mm. and they offered me a contract in sport for a year with no guaranteed job at the end of it, whereas the job in the Telegraph did. So my dad wasn't too happy about that, but mm. I took the job in sport because sport was what I was passionate about. And I grew up in the house that I, that I did with sport. My dad coached the Ulster rugby team for, for many years. So sport was always something that I loved. So I bend the politics part and yeah. moved into sport. The only time the politics degree was actually useful is when I started presenting the news right. for a couple of years. Yeah, yeah. So when I went into the newsroom, at least they, I could say when they went, what's the guy from Sport Down doing the news for? I could say, excuse me, I've got a politics well, degree. Well, hang on there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so was there, was there a moment where it just kind of clicked? Some people talk about the moment where something clicks and they go, yeah, that's what I'm going to do the rest of my life. Probably, yes. When I, I, I applied for a job in UTV while I was at university right. uh, to get the experience of filling in a job application form. And it was for a sports presenter. It was actually the job that Mark Robson ended up getting, who, who turned out to be a, a big mentor of mine in UTV. But when I got into that environment, I really enjoyed the work experience, but I never wanted to be in front of the camera. That isn't something that I ever planned to do. I like the writing. I like producing. I like working behind the scenes. But one night, somebody wasn't available to present the sport. And they said, do you want to get that young fella to do it? Wow. And I said, OK, I was taught, look, just say yes. If you can do it, just say yes. I said yes and presented the sport in one of their late sports bulletins. Absolutely bricking myself. I was so nervous. It was unbelievable. And from that moment on, I seemed to go, you know, I actually, people said, you did, you did OK at that. And I enjoyed it. And things just kind of developed from, from there. So mm. from that point of view, yes, I, I sort of fell into it that way. And you've done pretty much everything since. You've reported from the Olympics. You've reported yeah. from, you know, the, the the world golf tours. Everything. What what has been? If you kind of had to say the one thing that you you, you go, that was the best thing I, I ever did. The thing mm. I want to be remembered for. The thing that that'll be the memory that keeps you warm when you're old. Like what would that be? It. That's a very tough question because people often say, you know, what's your favorite sport? And I would say, well, it depends what time of year it is. Yeah. And there have been a number of things that I've been involved with that have been particularly memorable. But probably if I picked one, it was the relationship that we've had with our major golf champions yeah. and being stuck right in the middle of that success. It was an incredible period for sport in this country. I kind of think back what it must have been like if you were reporting on George Best at the yeah. time and you were able to get interviews with George Best. So what we were able to see, Graham McDowell, Rory McIlroy, Darren Clark and Padraig Harrington before that previously do during that short spell was incredible. And the one moment that will always stick with me is when Darren Clark won the Open Golf Championship and brought the famous Clara Jug back to Northern Ireland. Mm. He had been through, you know, a lot of trauma in his life, losing yeah. his wife to breast cancer. Um, but when he brought that jug home and walked through his own front door and handed it to his two boys, to see that amazing moment is something I think will, will probably always always mm. stick with me. Look, there have been I've been so fortunate. There have been yeah. so many memorable moments. I mean, Joey Dunlop winning at the at the Isle of Man TT in the year 2000, you know, in a super bike race, which he never thought he'd win, was incredible. And unfortunately, then went on to, to lose his life. Mm. Um, Michael Dunlop 
winning at the Northwest 200 just days after the death of his father, Robert, is something I will absolutely never forget. It's one of the most incredible sporting moments mm -hmm. I've ever seen and probably means a lot to me because it's at an event at home. We've yeah. been very fortunate to travel the world and, and see all these amazing sporting events, but the Northwest 200 is our own global sporting event and yeah. what he did resonated with people everywhere. It was just an, an incredible sporting event. I remember watching that. I mean, it was one of the most emotional sporting events I think I've ever seen. It was It was just incredible. I yeah. mean, he... he he didn't really want to race that day. It was his brother, William, who wanted to race. And then his, he said, well, if you're going to race, I'm going to race. And then his brother, William, broke down in the warm-up lap. I kind of say somebody was probably looking down on him and didn't push him out to race. But Michael went out and raced. I mean, it was a superhuman feat, yeah. what he did. Everybody was obviously very nervous because it was a very emotional time. His father just passed away on that same track two days yeah. before. So, you know, there, there wasn't a dry eye in the house. There was just yeah. tens of thousands of, of men, women and children, grown men crying at seeing this sporting achievement. It was, even thinking about it now, honestly, puts the hairs on, on the back of my neck yeah. stand up. So that, that was particularly special. And I suppose the one moment in my journalistic career that people mention to me quite often is the interview with Roy Keane when he left the World Cup in 2002 because yeah. we got this world exclusive interview with Roy Keane at the airport, which was the only, one and only time I've ever experienced something to go absolutely global. Yeah. Um, it, it was it was incredible. I mean, it was just amazing. Were you kind of, when you meet figures like that, like Roy Keane particularly, I love Roy Keane. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not a United fan, right? But I love Roy Keane and he's become one of the greatest pundits ever. I think he's brilliant. Because he just doesn't care. Yeah. He's also a very prickly, spiky character. Yes. And quite intimidating. Like, do, do, do you have you found that there's certain sporting figures have intimidated you just but either out of admiration or the sort of character they are? Yes, it, I mean, he, that intimidated me because he was leaving Saipan, a little island off Japan. Nobody really knew who he was. He was at an outdoor check-in, and we decided to go and try and doorstep him and get an interview with him. And the first time, he never flinched. Six or seven questions, he never even br broke breath or looked at me. But then we went back for a second <clears> go, and I, I did think at one point. He might grab me here because mm -hmm. he was a very physical, imposing character. Yeah. And after that interview, he was at an Ireland-England rugby match a few years later. And you had to walk down through the in the television interview area if you're a VIP. And he came walking through and I thought to myself, I'm going to go and ask again. But he gave me this, like, not knowing probably who I was, but he gave me just this almighty stare to say... <laughs> Don't even think about yeah. it. So yes, he he was pretty pretty intimidating. And and yes, there have been others, not so much in an intimidating way. But when you meet people who have been your heroes, I mean, I I worked with George Best. He was our pundit for some live Northern Ireland matches. Yeah, yeah. And when I was told he was our our pundit for a couple of games, I mean, honestly, when I was told the first time, I was like a kitten. Be in the same room as that guy. I was just what yeah. George Best. George Best. And I walked into Windsor Park. And I will never forget it. He was just sitting in the stand doing the Times crossword. Wow. I went, wow. I said, yeah, he does the Times crossword every day. And he wasn't that well at the time, yeah. but he was funny. He yeah. had an incredible sense of humor. He was he was just so good to work with. Yeah. And those moments, he was our pundit probably four or five times. And those occasions that we got to spend with him were, were absolutely priceless. You know, I felt yeah. so, so lucky that that happened. I mean, the, the, the raft of quotes... George Best <laughs> quotes from me. I mean, like Roy Keane's become a meme now. Yeah. You've seen all the I memes know. about Roy Keane. Just his kind of, his, his utter score yeah. on people. How does it feel to be part of all that? You're part of so many big historical sporting moments in Northern Ireland. How does it feel to be part of that? Special. Re re really special. And I feel very, very lucky. Mm. And the, uh, my, my colleague, Gary McCutcheon, who's shoot editor, who we have travelled together since the year 2002, probably since the, since the World Cup in Japan, when we go somewhere, we always stop and think about some of the other things that we've done. If you're sitting mm. on a flight somewhere. I think, can you believe that we were involved in that? Do you remember the time we did this? Do you remember Jonathan Ray won the World Superbike Championship? We flew home with him on a private jet. Do you remember Rory McIlroy won like his first major? We flew home with Rory McIlroy and got down the steps of the airport and travelled with him home. I mean, these things are just amazing mm. and we never take it for granted. It's, mm. You just feel so fortunate that you have a front row seat to these things and fortunate that these amazing global sports stars, you can call them your friends. Yeah. You know, you can you can ring them up, you can have a chat. You, you know, It's just sometimes, honestly, I have to sit back and go, what, <laughs> wow, you know, it's just... It's, it's great just you still have that thing. kind of sense of wonder about the whole thing. Yeah. You, I, you're not, you don't take anything for granted, like... No, never, yeah. never. I mean, you, you, you know, you apply for accreditation in the music world, you get, you mm -hmm. get great seats, you get access. 
we get our media accreditation. We sit on the halfway line at a rugby match or a football match. But you can never take it for granted. You know, we get to speak to the, to yeah. the players after the match. You know, we, we can we can ring them up and do interviews beforehand. It's I mean, it's just something that is very, very special. It's never lost on me. But I would like to think that I could go out to do a story, as I did recently, about a young girl who won uh, a medal, a trampolining. I would get as much excitement or give that as much effort as I will when I go to the Masters Golf Tournament to try and see... Rory McIlroy win the win the holy holy grail. Yeah. You know, you have to be as passionate about all sporting stories. I think you can't just be passionate about the really big ones, even though they are incredibly, yeah. incredibly special. I mean, something I want to talk to you about because I, I I kind of only heard of this quite late because you were very sort of private about it, and rightly so. Mm -hmm. It's your business, whatever. But during a lot of these things, you were you were very ill. Yeah. Yeah. You were ill, and you had to manage that. You had to get you had to get dialysis when you were away in different countries and all this. You had to do all of that I stuff. Did. How did you balance that? I mean, not just physically, but mentally. How did you how did you make your peace with all that? Um, that must have been incredibly <laughs> yeah. difficult. It, it it wasn't easy. Um, but when I had to go back on dialysis because my first kidney transplant from almost thirty years previous failed, I decided the way I was going to deal with it was I was going to work through it. Now I've gathered since then that not a lot of people actually probably work when they're on dialysis or not work full time when they're on dialysis. But that was my way of coping with it. And I wanted to prove that I could I could do it to myself. It probably wasn't the most sensible thing in the world to do, but I did. So I, I ended up having dialysis at the Masters Golf Tournament at the Ryder Cup in France at the Isle of Man TT, uh, a World Superbike round, the Open Golf Championship in Scotland, uh, just that, that I could continue to go to those events yeah. and work it. It's, it's not straightforward having dialysis away from home. Yeah. You know, they're kind of slotting needles up the inside of your arm, um, taking all your blood out and cleaning it. And but it takes a lot out of you as well. Yeah, Physically, you're it takes exhausted. A lot of you, you're, you, you, are, you are knackered. And it, Was it, there anybody it in your easy. life telling you you shouldn't be doing oh, this? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, my parents are saying, listen, should you not be trying to yeah. slow this down a, a little bit? But... I think they realized it was what was keeping me going yeah. and the hospital were happy. Most people use that dialysis to go on holiday. I used it to, to work, but dialysis was four times a week, five hours at a time. Right. And that's yeah. not including driving in to get it, going on the machine and coming off the machine. So I kind of went in half six in the morning, had my dialysis and then went straight to work after that. And ironically, during during that my time on dialysis, I was act had actually started making a documentary mm about the 50th anniversary of the Belfast City Hospital renal unit right. to celebrate the success that it has achieved and it is recognised globally. So during the making of that programme, I ended up back on dialysis myself. So The irony. <laughs> so, yeah, I know. So I, I was able to give a good first-hand account yeah. of, of what it was like. But listen, the Belfast City Hospital is incredible. Yeah. It is, it is world-renowned for its transplant programme. They do more live transplants per head of population than anywhere else in the world. They are globally lauded for, for what they do. If you're going to have a kidney problem, Northern Ireland is, is the place to, to have it. Yes, it wasn't an easy time. I think I just went on autopilot and, and kept going and always believed that I would get another kidney. And then I got a one in a million shot wow. and, I got a, and I got a match. And again, unbelievably, was able to have that kidney just before COVID. Have so. you always had, I mean, that, that's a lot of drive for an individual. Have you always been driven like that? Probably, yeah. Right. I mean, I, I get passionate about things. I've always been passionate about my job. I always want to do it to the best of my ability. I've been so fortunate to be in a job that I absolutely love. I know a lot of people do job. I know you. I mean, you're in a job you love. You're passionate yeah. about passionate about music and you know DJing and, and presenting. I am passionate about sport mm. and I love working in the media. So, and sometimes when people I'm working with, perhaps I'm going the extra mile and they aren't, then that irritates me. And that's wrong because, you know, they're still doing a very good job. Yeah. I just sometimes go over and above what I'm meant to do. Um, but yes, I probably am. I, f I do feel quite driven. And I think that's probably why I adopted that attitude when I have my transplant. But I just wanted to be able to do it, I suppose, to show people, listen, if you're on dialysis, you can mm -hmm. still work if you really want to. You can get through this and you, you can get a kidney transplant at the end. W one thing that struck me was, I did a couple of interviews around the time when I actually eventually said that I needed a transplant because the hospital were keen that I did because they said it would improve the transplant rate. Right. And I had said, you know, being on dialysis, it's a really miserable experience. What a depressing place the dialysis unit is. And the nurses in the hospital said, Stephen, can you stop saying that? Yeah. Because you're lucky, you're gonna get out but there are so many people who have dialysis who will never get a transplant. Right. So they make the experience there as good as it can possibly be, mm -hmm. even though it's not a 
it's not a, a wonderful yeah. place, place place to be going every day. How's you know? your health now? My health, my health. Touch wood, if I can, <laughs> uh, is is absolutely amazing. Right. Um, I feel I feel brilliant. My kidney function. I couldn't be doing the job that I'm doing now. Um, I'm like a Duracell bunny. Like I've got so much energy. It's uh, <laughs> it, it's 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 amazing. But the one thing that came out of my transplant, and you said that I was quite private about it at the time, and yes, I was because I just wanted to get on with it. Yeah. I suppose. Um, but the hospital persuaded me to do an interview on television and on radio about needing a transplant. Yeah. I felt very, very awkward about that because it felt like I was canvassing to get a kidney. But they said it, no. That, that, it didn't come across. No, they the said time, you're tra- you you will raise the awareness of transplantation exactly. and you will improve the transplant rate. And I said, no, I won't. And they went, it will. So within a couple of weeks, they had like 150 people who rang in, not to donate to me, but to offer to donate to strangers, mm-hmm. which it blew me away. And the one thing that will stick to me to the with me until the day I die is when I was recovering from my own operation on level eleven of the city hospital, I was walking around the ward trying to get some steps done to, to to get fit. And I met a man called Brian. And he wanted to speak to me. I didn't really want to speak to anybody because I was recovering. But he wanted to speak to me. And he came over and said, I just want you to know I donated a kidney two mm-hmm. days ago. I said, That's incredible. And he said he said, No, but I want you to know why. He said, because I heard your interview. And I was obviously yeah. floods of tears. It even gets me like thinking about it now because I think you actually donated a kidney because you heard me talking about it. Mm-hmm. That's incredible. So he helped save the life of a 40 odd year old lady in London with two kids. And I said, you have absolutely changed her life. And since then, I have met quite a few other people mm-hmm. who have told me the same. So from not wanting to do the interview, it makes me really grateful that I've actually yeah. done it. And actually, that's why I'm quite happy to sit and talk about it today well, as well. You've helped save people's lives. Well, not me by telling my story, it's just raised the awareness. The people who've donated the kidneys. Have, Can you have, just take have the bloody paid. compliment, <laughs> no, will you? No, you've I've helped saved, save people's lives. Saved, Come I, on. Well, th- by them donating their kidneys, they've, yes. they, they've, saved, they've saved people's lives. And I hope I've helped raise the awareness of the good job that, that the hospital do and what people can do. You don't need to die to save someone's life to donate mm. a kidney. The live transplant program has revolutionized kidney transplantation mm. in the last 10 or 15 years. That The transplant rate has quadrupled because people are genuinely walking into the city hospital and saying, I want to do something good. Yeah. I want to save somebody's life and give a kidney, which is incredible. Isn't it? Incredible. There must have been really low moments for you, though. It, pro- probably. I mean, just how did you keep going through that? Because I, you know, <laughs> when it looked like you might not get a kidney or something and things maybe looked a bit bleak on it like how did you keep going i always believed i would get a kidney right um because i just put my faith in the in the renal unit and the people in the hospital i mean tim brown my surgeon ashley courtney runs the program hannah mcgowan who's another surgeon just just to name but a few these people are incredible human beings you know they should all have knighthoods the whole lot of them (laughs) these people are saving people's lives every day of the week it's I mean, it is honestly unbelievable what they are doing. So I, I put my faith in them and I believed that I was going to get a get a new kidney. Yes, when you have to get up again at quarter to six in the morning, half five in the morning, and go in and lie there for five hours on dialysis. Um, that was, that was yeah, depressing at times. Mm. But my uncle, I, he was a wise old owl who was former headmaster of a, of a school in Belfast. And I told him how boring and how unrewarding sitting for five hours in dialysis was. So he said to me, there was a famous quote which I can't remember, but he said, when you feel like that, you should do something that feels worthwhile. Mm. So I thought, okay. So I thought about it and I thought, I have a, I have a real love and admiration for old older people. I, lo- I love my own grandparents. So I got chatting to Mary Peters. She mentioned EHNI have a, have a service um, that you could ring an older person who's perhaps lonely and mm. want, wants a chat. So I thought that sounds like a great idea. So I started doing that while I was on dialysis. Wow. Ringing one person, then another person, then another person. Unfortunately, one of those people has, has since passed away. Um, but the two people that I started phoning, I still speak to today. And I've, I've met them both. I have great fun with them. They probably, well, I've told them this, but they probably don't really believe me. They helped me as much as I was helping them because it meant it gave me a purpose while I was on dialysis. I was able to ring them a couple of times a week. We've built up great friendships. Um, they're, they're great. One, you know, one, of the, one, of, one of the men's 93, 94 years of wow. age of age. And he's a really good, we're really good pals now. We chat away about sport, life, everything. It's great. So from something which felt unrewarding to do something small like that, you know, brought a lot of joy to me as well. 
you need hugged more. <laughs> yeah, I'm, sure you, I'm sure you get hugged enough. I want to hug you right now. That's amazing. Let's take a short break there and head over to the doctor's surgery for a reminder about some ways we can be a little bit healthier. I'm Dr. Alan Stout and I'm a GP. If I can share one thing, it's this. I see far too many men coming in too late. If men would just get checked out by a doctor a bit sooner, I know for sure that lives could be saved and men's health improved. So I'm gonna share some of the things men should look out for and why they matter, and most importantly, what to do about them. Today, we're talking about heart health. And just to say the guidance around good heart health applies for the blood vessels in your brain as well. So we're talking about heart attack and stroke. First, some of the basics. A heart attack is when the supply of blood to the heart is suddenly interrupted. This happens when the major blood vessels playing the heart get clogged up with fatty deposits like cholesterol. This can make it harder for the heart to work and combine this with high blood pressure and your heart vessels will be placed under extra strain. The big threat comes if one of the fatty plaques in your coronary arteries ruptures, causing a clot, which can then stop the blood supply to the heart and a heart attack. For this basic explanation, you can start to see why a high fat diet, having high cholesterol or high blood pressure could increase your risk of coronary heart disease. And just to explain a stroke in similar terms, this is when the blood supply to part of the brain is cut off, and this can be from a clot or from a weakened blood vessel rupturing. As the blood carries oxygen, which the brain needs to function, a stroke can lead to brain injury, disability, or even death. So one of the simplest ways you can take control of your heart health is to arm yourself with the facts, get your cholesterol and blood pressure checked regularly, and take action if you don't like what you find out. One other condition I want to mention is known as triple A, which is abdominal aortic aneurysm. And this is when the main artery carrying blood from the heart to the stomach weakens and may rupture, causing life-threatening internal bleeding. Triple A is six times more likely in men than women, so there is a great screening program which is aimed specifically at picking this up. If you're a man aged over 65, you'll get a screening invitation in the post, and this involves an ultrasound scan, which is painless and it could save your life. Make the appointment and please do get checked out. A healthy diet, regular physical activity, not smoking and reducing stress all play a big part in reducing the risks of these conditions. The health benefits of making small lifestyle changes can be huge. Many serious conditions are preventable and with early detection, many are treatable. If you're in doubt, please make an appointment with your GP and get it checked out. HNI's Good Vibrations programme is for men over 50. If you or someone you know could use some advice or support on health, well-being or mental health, there's lots more information online at hni.org forward slash I connect. That's letter I C O N N E C T. Or visit hni.org forward slash good vibrations to sign up for monthly emails with expert tips and information. Remember, it's okay not to feel okay. The HNI Good Vibrations team are here with help and support. Let's get on to something uh, away from your kidney and close to your heart. Yes. Let's talk Morrissey. One of my great passions. This is something I always knew this about you, mm. right? But not not a lot of people know that. <laughs> no. <laughs> because like uh, I was a, a Smith's obsessive and Morrissey to a point. I've kind of lost the way because of Morrissey. To be fair, he makes it difficult. <laughs> You're still, you still got that flame going. I, I do. Tell me about the first time you heard the Smiths or Morrissey. I can tell you, no problem. I could sit and speak about this all day long. Um, Have we enough tape? Okay, <laughs> we great, okay. Uh, because I was a teenager mm. and a friend of mine at school gave me a, a an indie album of you know different artists and there was one song on it and I absolutely loved it and it was William, It Was Really Nothing mm. by the Smiths. So I then went and went, I must go and find out more about them and more about their music. So as I found out more about their music, I then just found out that they'd literally just split up. The yeah. band had, was no more. Yeah. So that's pretty much how I get into the Smiths and Morrissey. And I have been a devotee ever since. I, I went to see Morrissey in concert four times this year. This year, year. right. This so I wanted to ask, but you told me this earlier on. So how many times do you think you've seen him in total? I, I actually tried, because I went four times this year, I went to write it down and thought about all the gigs I've, I've been to, so probably 25 times. 
I've seen wow. Marcy down through the years in many different countries and, lo and locations. Yeah. And I don't know if I'm more passionate about Morrissey than sport, but there's a, a thin tissue paper does in between. Does it depend on the day? In, in, in between them both. Yeah, you it know, depends on the day, I think, yes, doesn't yes. it? Yes, If he wrote a song about sport, then that would be... I can't see that ever happening. Well, my hurling days are, are done. <laughs> yeah, that, that was that was a recent song, so yeah. Um, so, but see, but back then, I don't, I don't think people knew you were a Marcy fan back then. No, probably not. Pro yeah. pro probably not. Um, and I've got, listen, I've got signed stuff. I've got, uh, listen, as I said, about a thousand items of cassettes, 12 yeah. inch, 7 inch albums, you name it. I don't have it all. But I continue to collect it. I said I was going to stop, and it really is a it really stop. is a bad habit. It's now turned into a very expensive habit. But yeah. you know, don't drink, don't smoke. What do you do? Yeah, yeah. Morrissey. That's so, it. Fine. You remember you were at the gig in Oma? Uh, yes. Uh, Morrissey played Oma Leisure Centre. Mm. Uh, what year? I'm terrible at remembering years of things. What oh, year was it? That? Must be ten years ago. I'm sure. It was longer. Yeah, maybe it was longer, longer than ten years ago. And do you remember the big kick up at the time was they couldn't get sausage rolls in the Leisure Centre. That's right. Because he That's stopped right. them cooking sausage rolls. Yeah, no meat products. And my mate Sean was up in arms. He was taking his kids to the swimmers <laughs> that day. And he was up in arms. He couldn't get his kids a sausage roll. And that was that actually made the papers know him. Yeah, that's the, yeah. <laughs> one, one of the, I was at a concert at the Point Theatre as well. And there was, you know, no no hamburgers for sale. No hot food for sale in there. You know, meat, meat is murder and all that. So. Mm. so that's the thing. He makes it so difficult. Have you been to Salford Lads Club? No, never. I've never I see, done I either. see photographs all the time on yeah. social media, and I'd really love to go. And I've been to Manchester, obviously. Shall loads. we and do that? that? Yes, I, I would love to do if that. I would go there, I'd like to go with you. Can I would, we do I would, that? Oh, I'd love to go. Can we go to Salford yeah, Lads Club? I would love to go to. I'd I mean to it. Go. Yeah. No, I, I mean it too. I, want, right. I really want to go. We're going to do this. Yes, we're going to do it. I want to do this. We're going to do it. Do you find music's very cathartic for you? I do. Listen I, to Morrissey. Because people yeah. think Morrissey's quite depressing. I was going, no, he's not actually. He's very, very funny. Yeah, not not in the slightest. The Smiths kind of always cheered me up in a way. And even playing music, I. I played music when I was growing up. I played the trumpet in the school of music for many years. I wasn't particularly good. We got my grade six or seven. Played in a little jazz band. L absolutely always loved Not music. Not particularly good, but played in a jazz band. Yeah, but we weren't, we weren't great. <laughs> we, I, I promise you we weren't great. We busked down the city centre a few times. We weren't wonderful. But I but I, but I enjoyed it. Play, and I played the, the euphonium in the cornet. So I've always kind of liked, liked music. But, I mean, in the car, I have got the complete works of Morrissey and the Smiths every single song they've ever written and performed and when I get into the car it just automatically comes on I can't say I listen to much else bar Morrissey and the Smiths really? yeah but I, I, I do I, I, I do vary it sometimes yeah. I listen to some songs that other songs that I like but pretty much it's Morrissey and the Smiths every day you see he, he got <laughs> me into because like, like I said I was obsessed with the first band I ever saw and I knew, for me, it was that that was my moment where I went, I, I'm going to be involved in the music industry in some way. I'm never going to be able to sing or play anything. <laughs> I thought, this is, this is what I want. Because I just absolutely fell in love with this band. I mean, I loved them before, but that was it. It was an mm -hmm. amazing moment. But Marcy kind of got me into bands like Sparks and the New York Dolls and things mm -hmm. like that, because he talked about them at the time. I've, I knew, listened, I've listened to them too because of that reason. But I yeah. knew very little about them. Me neither. Like, I thought Sparks were English for about mm -hmm. a decade. Because before the internet, you didn't really know it. They weren't, no. nobody really cared about Sparks in the 80s. But Marcy kind of led me to, and, and loads of authors he led, he led me on to. I mean, when, when someone like that, I figure like that kind of enhances your life and everything. Mm. Um, that That is something that really does keep you going, I think. Yeah, I, I do too. Cause I, I mean, I've read the complete works of Oscar Wilde, mm. probably because of Morrissey. Yeah. Um, and, and listened to many other bands because of because of Morrissey. Um, I did a lot. I love music in my, in my you know, teenage years and yeah. student years, all the indie stuff at the time. You know whether it was the Jesus and Mary Chain, the Wedding Presidents, Barrel Carpets, all of those, all of those kind of bands, which I still listen to today. Current music today, mm. I have great difficulty with listening to to much of it. To be honest, mm. um, the odd time something comes along, I like the Killers. Um, mm. I did like them, but apart from any other bands recently, there's not many I'd really listen to. Um, I just continue to listen to the stuff from. I don't know whether that's the same as everybody. If you like the Beatles when you were growing up, you still yeah. listen to those, or whatever in the seventies. But yeah, I mean, m music has played a big. Mm. Part in my life. Um, See, it's not just a fan. You're an avid collector. I am of Morrissey yeah, stuff. Yeah, I know. Smith stuff. I know. It's it, you listen. You just get down into a rabbit hole and you can't stop. Yeah. I don't know what it is. I'm just. I absolutely love the artwork of the albums. Yeah. I I just love I love collecting it all. So I've got almost a thousand. <laughs> a thousand. See, I can get that because they. I always felt the Smiths got everything right. They did. The albums are class. The names great. Yeah. The albums are great. All the photographs were great. Even yeah. the fonts, the Smith's font, that yeah. classic Smith's font, which I can see in my head. And he drew, those, said, he drew those all out himself. Yeah. Mm. They got everything right in terms of being a band. I mean, to me, they're, Morrissey and Mar are like the greatest British songwriting duo since the Beatles. I agree with you. For sure. I agree with you. And I remember I when they split up, I was distraught, like absolutely distraught. 
because it, it didn't seem fair mm. to me. Because they only had, I mean, they only had a career of, what four years something. Yeah, like that. I didn't have to go through that. You see, because I was they'd already, they'd already split up. I heard it on the radio one on the news. Mm. And I was like, what? Because this was the band I was so obsessed with, and it was no more. And I was like, that can't be right. Mm. You know what I mean? But that's what happened. Yeah, I mean, Morrissey was voted. Um, the biggest icon in mm. of the UK, you know, in the twentieth century, mm. and I would, I would, I would, I would go down with that. Okay. <laughs> What's the furthest length you've went to to go see Morrissey? Oh goodness, um, I saw him in America. Um, I've seen him all over the UK and Ireland. I took a week off work and went to see him in every concert he played in Ireland. Um, you were probably at a couple of the concerts as well. <laughs> I actually saw him in the Rialto in Derry when it was still open at the time. Yeah, it's yeah. one of the smallest venues ever. Mm -hmm. I mean, the last concert I went to or one of the last concerts in Glasgow I did go to the stage door just to see him coming in I knew he wouldn't stop but I wanted to see him up close coming in I know that's really sad if he's like a teenager no, or did you see oh him? I did I saw him between you know from you to me that, wow. that distance but I always have thought I'd like to meet him I've always thought what mm. I would say if I met him which would probably be really cheesy but then sometimes I think no I don't want to meet yeah. him I just want well, I know you have met him I did because you see in that that always makes me green with envy. No, the know, thing is, so. I was never as nervous. Like I, I was looking after him. He was in Belfast for the Hot Press Awards. He was giving yeah. out an award to you too, like a Lifetime Achievement Award to you too. And my guy said, oh, you're Morris. We need somebody to look after Morris. I know you're a big fan. I was going, I don't know, man. <laughs> I was like, I, I don't know if I want to do that. Because yeah. it was, what, 90, 95 or 96 or something? Yeah. He was lovely. Like, he was seriously one of the nicest people and incredibly warm. And do you know what was a big thrill for me, right? This is a weird, you know, you get weird kind of things. When he shook my hand, right? Down his arm came this big chunky ID bracelet, and I was like, yeah. and it just had Morrissey written on it. And like yeah. that, for some reason, I was like, <laughs> nah, that's cool. See, that day I was looking after Morrissey, right? Yeah. And I hear saying this, it sounds like I, I, it, was, it was kind of thrust upon me, right? It's not like I was in any position. Oh, I'd have been there in a heartbeat. No, but the thing is, it was like I, I was over the moon, right? But I kind of wanted to pretend that, that it wasn't a big deal. Because when you kind of go, well, you're my hero, hmm. they're going to like the shutters down, we shop, shop, good night, Irene, right? So I kind of was like, and after a while, I asked him to say, he signed something for me. And that was great. That was all very well. And he was just, he was just knocking around in uh, Blackstaff House, just in a, a room. All he wanted to do was go to this room and have a cup of tea and all this stuff. And then he said, um, I said, you want dinner? Do you want something for dinner? He said, he said yes, can you, can you get me a vegan pizza? <laughs> and Pizza Express had just opened, like which was the posh pizza place mm -hmm. in Belfast. Still probably is. Um, so I phoned around and said, well, I'm phoning from the BBC here on an account, blah, 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 because, you know, we built... I need a vegan pizza. I said, hang on a minute. I went off to ask the chef. And this guy came away and went, hello? And I said, yeah, I'm looking at vegan pizza. Is it for Morrissey? <laughs> and I went, uh, I didn't know. Should I? I said, yeah, he's right. Okay. He said, can I hand it to him? And I went, yeah, of course. And he came around the back gate for me and said, there's this guy here with a delivery from Morrissey. So I go down. And there's this guy in a chef's way. and like holding the pizza. And he's like this. He's like holding the box like this, right? I said, come on up. He didn't speak to me the whole way up. He was just like, you know. And we go in, and I said, come on in. He goes in, he hands the pizza box. And he almost sort of bowed. He almost like, like the weird curtsy thing. He handed it to him, just went and nodded to him. I went out. I followed him out and said, Did you not, do you not want to kind of chat to him? Or like, get his autograph? I got his autograph. He's really nice. He went, no. And this is the most heroic thing. He went, no. He said, he's eating my food, and that's enough. <laughs> and off he walked, right? And it was the most noble thing I think I've ever witnessed. He just walked off. That's nice. Into the met, night. But he's met him. I'll tell you, know. you. I'll tell you a story about that. About that. Those hot press awards. Yeah. I was sitting at home, and they came on the BBC, and I went. Morrissey is in. It was in the Europa Hotel. Is yeah. that correct? Morrissey is in the Europa Hotel. I got in the car and I drove down to find out that it was pre-recorded the night before. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I did have one opportunity to go and meet him. One, one, this day because Christine Blakely who, who I know well yeah. from, from working in BBC Northern Ireland she's presenting the one show yeah. and Morrissey for some unknown reason has decided to go on the one show yeah. apparently because his mum loved the programme yeah. so she said do you want to come over mm. so I said yes so I took cold feet at the very oh, last come on. minute and didn't go he was really good on the one show I know and I just thought why did I not go mm. but she very kindly sent me a signed CD of his latest album to Stephen from Morrissey, and then admitted she was so scared of him, she wouldn't go in and ask for it, so she sent the Adrian Childs. <laughs> <laughs> but it was very kind of her to, to do that. Yeah. So, but I, I sort of regret not going. I regret not going to meet him. One day, maybe. You never know. Do you think you could do it now? Oh, I could. I think I, think I could. Yeah, I just wouldn't want to be disappointed, now? but you've told me he's lovely. Other people who've met him said he's lovely. I don't think I'd be disappointed. No, I, I don't think. So. See, the thing is, I think he'd be spiky with a music journalist. Was yes. I, where I wasn't there as a music journalist. I was there just as a kid who had to look after him. Yeah, I don't want to interview him or anything. I just no. want to. I want to meet him and just say thank you. 
because um, he's been such a big part of my yeah. of my life. I mean, when I, when I kind of realized my time was up, where he had, he had to go off and get ready, whatever, and I said to him, by the way, I said, um, the Smiths were the first band I ever saw. I said, I was 13 years of age, and it completely changed my life. And it did. And he went, and he had this false, a beautiful false modesty. He went, I couldn't possibly have changed anyone's life. <laughs> and he was, you could see the smirk on his face. Like, I mean, he, he's he's very self-aware. Yeah, well, I mean, he- But he was lovely. Like. His music- undoubtedly helped me through my first transplant operation because right. in the room I was in having my kidney transplant, I had a picture of Morrissey on the wall. Wow. I brought I brought it in. You know, I was 17 years old, so I, I kind of made it like my bedroom wall in there. I had a picture of Morrissey I on the wall. I didn't realize you were that young. Yeah, oh yeah. With the first transplant. <laughs> oh, the first no, transplant. No, not you, not yeah, young yeah, generally. Thanks. No, I um, didn't realize you were that young when you had your first transplant. Yeah, I was. What was I, that like? I mean, you were. I was 17. This is like when you were a 18, teenager. I was 18. Yeah, I was 18. When you were a teenager. Your mates are going out to mm. clubs and bars and you've got to go through that. What was that like that age? I, it, 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 it wasn't particularly easy, but I think at the time, because when they told me I needed a transplant, I didn't even know really what your kidneys did, yeah. to, to be fair. And because my dad was giving me my first kidney, it was quite a new thing then. You know, now live donations obviously very, very, very regular. So it was it was hard for my mom and my sister because they were worrying about my dad and, and me. So yeah, that it was tough. It was tough. And I, I mean, I, I remember I used to have a big tube here for my dialysis. And I remember being in the Crescent <laughs> nightclub down there in Sandy Row, kind of with my shirt with a big bulge in here going, boys, listen, watch this. So I still tried to go out and have as normal a time as possible. But it wasn't life. Life wasn't normal. But once I got my transplant, I was absolutely flying. Flying. It lasted for 30 That's years. That's a lot to take on, though, that you're... Yeah, because I repeated my first year at Queen's. Yeah. Um, University. I wanted to go to Glasgow. I didn't go to Glasgow. I stayed at Queen's. Best thing I ever did because I ended up working in hospital radio, working in B City Beat or BCR as it was then, yeah. you know, music programs, and ended up getting my opportunity in, in UTV at the time. Yeah. So everything happens for a reason. So yeah. it actually all worked out for the better. It's that idea of, of it's a brush with death and you're very young. Yeah, I mean, at the, at the time, I think because you're younger, you get on with it. The second time around, I sort of knew m more what to ex mm. what to expect. Because I think for a long time, when they told me my kidneys were failing the second time, they said, you need to go and find somebody, you know, who might donate. I kind of went, it'll be fine. I'll wait till the after. Then I'll go to the Olympics here in a couple of years and then I'll worry about it, which was the most stupid thing to do mm -hmm. because it did go downhill very quickly. And I wish in a way I'd kind of listened, you yeah. know, to, to what my consultant was saying, because I think it was probably, it takes me a lot to admit this, but it was probably in denial that I, I felt okay. But that's but quite I common, though. Yeah, I wasn't feeling okay. Yeah. And when they said, there's a list of 10 things um, associated with kidney failure, how many of those do you have? And I went, eight. Wow. So then I, you know, I realized, you know, it's swollen ankles, itchy skin, insomnia, just things like that. Um, not massively, you know, bad things, but, but all, all, together? all together, all adding yeah. up. Obviously, my kidney function had dropped below 10%, so I was urgently needed to go on dialysis. So, and how do you kind of look after your health now? I do you have do you have, to have a special regime? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I try and eat as healthily as I possibly can, which doesn't always work because because I, I have wasn't able to eat chocolate for about five or six years, being on dialysis and a special diet before that. Mm. So I try and walk as much as I can, play a lot of golf, um, and just try and keep my fitness up as best I can. Try and try and maintain the same weight mm. if I possibly can, just to be as healthy as possible because I know. If I'm healthier now, it'll make my my kidney last a bit longer. Mm. So that's that's the plan at the minute. It's good you can kind of because you're it's something you're going to be constantly aware of. Yeah, it's funny when you when you my first transplant, you kind of not that you forget that you have it, but you just live life in a normal way, yeah. which is what I do now. Yeah. But I know sometimes there are things that you know you have to back off a little bit, or you know not get yourself too exhausted, or just try and try and be as healthy as you possibly can. I, I not regret, but I probably could have looked after my first kidney even better than I did. Right. I did look after it well. It lasted for 30 years. But I know there are probably certain things I could have done to, to kind of elongate the, the lifespan of that. So I just try and be as, as healthy as I possibly can. You're looking well. Thanks very much. Feeling good. Thank yeah. you very much, Steve. Pleasure. It's been a pleasure. pleasure. Thank you very much indeed. I enjoyed chatting. This charming man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Before we finish off today, let's take a minute or two to pause with Owen O'Kane. We have some great advice on how we can be kind to our mind. I'm Owen O'Kane. I'm a Sunday Times bestselling author, psychotherapist, and former NHS lead for mental health. And today I'm going to be talking about the importance of checking in with yourself. Now, that might sound like a really obvious thing to do, but trust me, it's such an important thing, particularly for better mental well being. Now in Northern Ireland we have a great expression, 
what's the crack? We are great at asking other people how they are, what's going on for them, and more importantly, we often want to help. Now I've got a question for you. When was the last time you stopped to ask yourself, what's the crack? When was the last time you stopped to try and work out what's going on for you? And by that I mean what's going on in your mind, what's going on with your emotional state, what are you struggling with, what made you need help with, because this is such an important thing, often we don't do this, and when we don't then we're in autopilot and we suddenly can start to struggle or feel overwhelmed. So the important thing is to create time in your day, just every now and then to stop and work out, okay, what's going on in my mind today? What are the things that are bothering me? What are the emotions that are around today? What can I do today that makes it a bit easier? Who could I ask for help? What would a positive step forward be? So checking in isn't some just fluffy, insignificant thing. It's a really, really important part of better mental well-being. So if you haven't stopped today to check in with yourself, I'm going to encourage you to do so. What's the crack with you? It can make the world of difference. Age and I are the local experts on later life. If you or someone you know is struggling to navigate the challenges of life after 50 and need information or advice on benefit entitlements, housing or care for a loved one, call the Age and I advice line in confidence 9 to 5 Monday to Friday on 0808 808 7575. That's it for this episode of How's the Form? Hope you'll join us next time. How's the Form is brought to you by AGNI and is part of the Good Vibrations Over 50s Men's Health Programme, which is funded by Movember. Movember.